Um, so it's my pleasure to welcome our next keynote speaker, Eric Jarvis. Eric is a professor at the Rockefeller University. He's also a Howard Hughes medical investigator. He's received numerous awards. I'll mention just two. The NIH Director's Pioneer Award back in 2005. And he more recently was awarded the NIH Director's uh, Transformative Research Award. He's headed up numerous consortia, including those efforts to sequence human uh, vertebrates. And really, his work is now going to take us through from understanding genetics and neurobiology to um, studying behavior and specifically vocal learning in songbirds. I'm told that his um, he grew up in a family of musicians, so maybe it's suitable and fitting that he's the one to unravel that biology. And over to you, Eric. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I was at this meeting once also a long time ago. And uh, it feels different now. And it's the first time I've met it uh, since the uh, pandemic. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me and to uh, talk about uh, some of the things that uh, I've been involved in, and I couldn't decide which consortium title to put on the slide here, so I, I encompass all of them, large-scale, high-quality reference genome projects, and to learn some history about them and my own particular um, foray in, into this area. And so which, some of you have heard different parts of this story before or know about it, um, but I think it's important to get some of the history of where we've been and where we're going uh, to understand where we're going uh, and how that's going to drive the genomics community. So let's see if this works. All right. My um, <clears throat> uh, you know, um, foray into genomics really comes about actually with bacterial molecular genetics, but then neuroscience. Uh, my interest has been understanding the brain pathways that control the ability to produce imitated speech like I'm doing now with you. Uh, this is a pretty rare trait. Uh, to produce learned sounds. It's only found in five groups of mammals, us, us humans, of course, but dolphins, bats, elephants, and seals, and three groups of birds, songbirds, parrots, and hummingbirds. Uh, and, uh, but language, as we uh, uh, know it in our everyday experience, consists of other traits besides vocal learning that is necessary for it, but is actually more ubiquitous amongst the animal kingdom, like auditory learning. Your pet animals have this ability. Uh, dogs can uh, learn how to understand what the meaning of the word sit is, or siente se, or osuwari. Does anybody know what language osuwari is? In Japanese. There's no Japanese people here? Okay. So, <laughs> um, and uh, so that's because dogs can understand, and many other animals can learn in the auditory domain to understand human speech sounds, but not say, okay, you got it, I will sit. No. Uh, instead, a dog goes woof. And you can learn how to woof in different social contexts, but not necessarily uh, how to imitate the sounds. Now, not all vocal learners are equal. Some are more advanced than others. That is, the human vocal learners. The parrots have to be, happen to be the most advanced non-human vocal learners. And here's an example. Never shake a baby bird. That would surely be absurd. Never shake a baby bird. That would surely be absurd. I am not a crook. My name is Tesco. So you can understand why I like to study these animals. <laughs> and I want to know what's going on genetically with them that this parrot can learn 400 words and recombine them and so forth, uh, kind of get the category wrong about the dog. There was a cat in the house. That's why I said meow. But uh, you know what's going on there? And so uh, my lab and a number of other labs, we discovered that in the vocal learning uh, species like parrots, so hummingbirds, and songbirds, uh, they have these brain structures in red and uh, yellow here that are necessary for learning how to produce imitated sounds. Uh, and you can find them only in the vocal learning species, but not the non-learning birds. You can find in blue here these auditory pathway regions that's responsible for that auditory learning that a dog learns how to sit. Um, but, and it's, it's consistent with like chickens and quails having it, but uh, also parrots and songbirds for the auditory pathway. And interestingly, when you look at humans versus non-human primates, you see some functional similar relationships in brain regions. I color-coded them to similar functions 
and connectivity, whereas only humans have, or at least more advanced versions of, of vocal communication areas in their forebrain that are functionally similar to what you see in these birds uh, that you can't find in non-human primates or n other non-mammalian, uh, I mean mammalian uh, non-vocal learning species. So what's going on here? We find this convergence at the behavioral, the anatomical levels, according to this phylogenetic tree. But when we discovered these brain regions here, um, lots of people were skeptical that all these birds inherited from a common, I mean, were evolved it convergently. Looking at this tree here, some might argue there was a common ancestor back here and four multiple losses. So uh, I want to know about the genetics of this trait, but also uh, using phylogenetics, uh, we wanted to know what's the tree really wrong. All right, and so um, I teamed up with this, uh, these three guys here, uh, Oliver Ryder, uh, Steve, Steve um, <coughs> oh my goodness, I'm blanking out here, O'Brien and David Hauser. Okay, yes, <laughs> Steve will be really embarrassed. I'm, you know, really upset if I, you told him I said that. So anyway, um, <coughs> they formed what's called the Genome 10K Consortium to sequence the genomes of 10,000 vertebrate species using next generation technology when Illumina was coming online and Roche 454. And the proposal there was uh, now we have, it's going to become cheaper and faster to do these genomes. Let's form a consortium, pick a number, 10,000, uh, and propose a white paper study. And uh, that got me and other people excited because I wanted my parrots, songbirds, and their close relatives and all the other species sequenced. And I couldn't convince NIH or NSF just to give me money for my own species. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> I joined the G10K consortium along with two other guys, Goji Zhang and Tom Gilbert. Uh, we wanted to focus on birds, to ask, is the tree wrong? Uh, and other questions that uh, many other people had on bird phylogeny. So we teamed up, formed a bird group, uh, which, we called the, which we called it eventually the Avian Phylogenomics Consortium, and with support from BGI and our own labs, uh, amongst a large co consortium of collaborators, a sequence beyond the finch and the chicken at that time of 48 bird genomes representing all bird orders, uh, including multiple vocal learning songbirds, parrots, and hummingbirds, and close relatives actually according to different phylogenetic trees in the literature. Uh, and so one year, parrots had their closest relatives was um, owls, right? And another year, depending on some other genes, it was falcons. And that was really annoying me as a neuroscientist who wanted to study this trait. It's like one year, chimpanzees are our closest relative, and another year, with another set of genes, it's gorilla. And so, uh, <clears throat> so I got more involved than I imagined. Uh, with all these genomes, we had a lot of people flock to us. Uh, and uh, we had a special issue on, on, on this and a number of papers published in the several year period. It was really exciting, a uh, period of time. And uh, what about the phylogenetic tree? This is the tree we had come up using a genome scale tree of all these different bird lineages. And here are the rearrangements in the tree structure uh, according to this genome scale tree as opposed to using a few genes or DNA hybridization. Uh, and what about the vocal learners? Uh, songbirds, parrots, and hummingbirds. Hummingbirds were pulled much further away from these two up here, indicating either three gains, or if there was a common ancestor at the time of the mass extinction of dinosaurs, you have to explain ten losses uh, to sh for these similar brain pathways here. Uh, so this, by parsimony, mostly supports an independent origin hypothesis still, uh, now that we got a more correct tree. So really, I was excited. So it's convergent. Let's look at the genomes. Uh, and the brain transcriptomes in these regions. And that's uh, what we did with uh, students and postdocs in my lab at the time now who are their own research groups. And doing uh, what was then not RNA-seq but oligomicroarray profiling, uh, we identified two regions of the songbird song system uh, that control, uh, here, here's the other one, yes, that control uh, the ability to produce learned sounds and the imitation of that learned sounds for area X here, uh, that had conversion up or down regulated expression in the human speech motor cortex, laryngeal motor cortex, in the arison nucleus here, uh, that we could not find in non-vocal learning bird species or non-human primates uh, that didn't learn how to speak, of course. And, um, and so red is upregulated, blue is downregulated. Each column is a sample from a particular species like songbirds, the human laryngeal motor cortex. Each row is a gene. And you can see the gene expression profile for the vocal production learning region of songbirds, parrots, and hummingbirds is more similar to the human laryngeal motor cortex than it is to other birds' motor systems or other parts of the human cortex. So we're really excited here. 
Uh, and now we got 50 genes that had this convergence between songbirds and humans, and I, and I threw everybody in the lab onto studying these 50 genes uh, to st um, study their function in vocal learning circuits. And what we soon discovered with these assemblies is that they were highly fragmented. All right, like one of our favorites, split one gene, was split into uh, 35, it has 35 exons, but it had a lot of gaps here uh, in the contigs such that we were seeing that we're missing parts of genes or missing entire genes. Uh, they were incorrectly assembled, many of them. Uh, we're finding interesting repetitive regions in the promoters of some of these genes that were specialized in song and speech circuits. Uh, they weren't assembled properly. Uh, and this is causing postdocs and students in my lab to take many months, sometimes a year or more, to reclone these genes using the old-fashioned uh, Sanger approach and stitching things together to get the correct structure at the single molecule level. And, uh, and if we did not do that, we and others were unknowingly working with artifactual gene structure and sequence and unknowingly making false conclusions about the biology. So good enough for generating a phylogenetic tree and some other genome scale stuff, but not good enough to study gene function with gene manipulations. And so, um, <clears throat> So uh, those, five, those three guys that I told you about in the, in the beginning who talked about uh, the Genome 10K Consortium, they came to me and said, Eric, uh, can you do with the G10K organization more broadly what we did with the Bird Group and you know, come up with some success stories? I kind of reluctantly agree because I'm a neuroscientist first and a genome biologist second. But um, knowing that all the troubles that we had, I said yes under uh, two conditions. One is, instead of 10,000 vertebrate species, if we're going to put all our energy and effort into this project, we should just go for all 70,000 species, all right? Uh, and do it in this phylogenetic scale of all orders, families, and genera, and so forth. And secondly, uh, we should spend a few years really trying to produce the highest quality, um, error-free, near-gapless, chromosomal level assembly as possible and do it in phases such that we can address fundamental questions in biology, disease, and conservation. And the G10K consortium agreed to this, and just by matter of you know, natural transitions, it's now uh, being called the Vertebrate Genomes Project. And um, <coughs> uh, what I did was pull together or assembled an assembly team of people uh, that's shown here, at least as we were in 2019, had Adam Philippi chair the, uh, uh, the, the assembly team for the consortium. And for really, for a four-year period, and even up until this day, I'll tell you towards the end, uh, you know, we've been getting together every Friday um, since 2017 and trying to uh, uh, test different hypotheses about how to make assembly quality better and better. Uh, and before we pulled the plug on what we're going to do for phase one of the VGP, we took, whoops, uh, we took one hummingbird species, uh, a ruby-throated hummingbird, and it was a vocal learner, so I made sure we had a vocal learner, and, uh, and applied, uh, did a bake-off study, all the different technologies that we could, that were available at that time with PacBio, Nanopore, uh, BioNano, HiC, and so forth, and applied all these different approaches to get the best assembly we got, uh, and again, uh, from that, applied it across uh, not just um, that one hummingbird, but also uh, an assembly pipeline across 16 species. Now, this is old now. This is outdated. Things go out of date in six months in the world of gen gen genomic assembly. Uh, but at that time, the big lesson here that we learned was that one technology, whether it was long reads or short reads or bio nano maps, high C and so forth, was not sufficient to get a good high quality assembly. At that time, we started calling this the kitchen sink approach. You needed to combine multiple technologies together. And in this case, we did an iterative scaling up first of content uh, using long reads, uh, scaffolding using 10x genomics at the time, optical maps, high C scaffolding further, many of you know about this. And uh, we had to polish as well. Once you have a qu high quality genome, you got to get rid of base call errors that creep in there, particularly with long, the lower quality long reads at that time. And you have to curate, uh, manually curate and find errors. And so we did that and um, we were happy uh, uh, with some things. For example, looking at the uh, Contig N50 versus the scaffold N50 uh, of short versus long reads. No matter what algorithms we used, uh, no, and no matter what kind of, uh, um, uh, let's say, you know, uh, phasing tools or anything that we use, 
Uh, we could never get contigs that match what we, N50s that would match with the long reads. Further, we could get scaffolding like that, but once you got scaffolds that are in the 10, 20, 100 megabase uh, N50 region, you find that they have 10 to 100 to 70,000 or so incorrect joins, all right, that's going on inside the scaffolds. Uh, at this time, HiC was coming online for uh, chromosome mapping, and after curation, you can fix some of them. Uh, and we developed tools that measured the size of chromosomes in a karyotype map, uh, and the sizes of these scaffolds uh, are strung together through HiC, and find a nice good correlation in predicted sizes, uh, knowing that we're starting to get close to chromosome scale. And some of my favorite genes, actually most of them, uh, like the slit one gene, the missing regions were well, the gene is assembled in one long contig here, uh, and we're getting the correct protein coding sequence structure, which we were getting incorrectly before. And now we can study it more fu functionally and properly uh, through gene manipulation studies. Uh, those genes, I told you, I told you there were two regions of convergence between songbirds and humans that we found. With more complete genomes, we found more genes. Instead of 55, 350 genes that were uh, convergent between songbirds and humans. Here is a heat map of that convergence for two different song nuclei with the human laryngeal motor cortex regions. Uh, like the RA, we confirmed the match to the laryngeal motor cortex. Another cell type for HPC to the laryngeal motor cortex, and area X here. And even the different cell types, now we can do RNA-seq. Um, we're finding it's mostly the projection neurons that make these specialized connections to the laryngeal or the syringeal muscles in birds that show convergence here in, um, uh, with human speech areas. So uh, <clears throat> uh, what about what was really missing? And what was missing was interesting. It wasn't evenly missing DNA sequences in the Illumina or Sanger-based assemblies. Here is the zebra finch uh, genome. The outer map here is the different macro chromosomes, the micro chromosomes on this side. And uh, in turquoise is regions of the genome that were sequenced in the previous Sanger-based reference. And in purple are newly identified chromosomes almost entirely missing in the previous reference. And what is so special about these chromosomes, microchromosomes that were previously missing? They're very GC rich throughout the entire chromosome. So these uh, short read technologies, both Lumina and Sang were having trouble sequencing through these GC rich regions. And if you have a GC rich chromosome, it's very fragmented and almost missing. Uh, but if you look at what's missing inside the chromosomes and dig a little deeper, uh, it's not just evenly missing across the chromosomes. What was preferentially missed here in red is showing the percent missing sequences as you get closer and closer to the start site of the protein coding genes. You find more and more missing sequence, such that in the, our hummingbird, roughly 50% of the promoters were missing uh, in front of the, there was a gap. All right, and when you, we looked at uh, the GC content, it marched along in this first 2,000 base pairs that as you got closer and closer to the start site of the UTR, you have higher and higher GC content. And not just for missing genes, for every pro protein coding gene, well not every, about 80% of the protein coding genes in birds, mammals, reptiles, uh, sharks. The fish, you didn't have that signal as much, but it was still there in all vertebrate species. Uh, and what's interesting in the UTR region here, and the first exon, we also find a high GC rich sequence that was uh, preferentially missing in the uh, three prime, five prime ends of many uh, genes. Uh, interestingly, as you got in multi-exon genes, as you got closer and closer to the three prime end, the GC content uh, uh, went down. The introns did not have, of uh, these same protein coding genes, did not have this issue. So, uh, <clears throat> so when we look at uh, the regulation in these promoter regions, that is the ATAC-seq profiles and the gene expression patterns like uh, the dopamine receptor expressed in the striatum of birds, mammals, reptiles. What we found is that in red here, are those GC rich regions upstream of the coding sequence, and this was, was previously missing. Here's an example. And here we have an ATAC seq profile of open chromatin in this previously missing region that can explain the upregulation of the dopamine receptor inside versus outside of the uh, striatum versus the cortical regions. Another gene, a gene CADPS2, upregulated specifically in song nuclei in some other brain regions. And when we profiled the ATAC seq profile there, uh, once again, uh, this GC rich region here, previously missing in the older assemblies, is precisely where we see the differential ATAC seq profile that could explain the enhancer that will upregulate this gene in the song learning nucleus. 
Uh, and so uh, we've been looking for these things for years, and we couldn't find them. Why? They're GC-rich regions that are missing. Uh, and so um, <clears throat> what about uh, uh, phasing? Well, <clears throat> we found that uh, in some of the earlier studies we're doing with these long reads, actually with help from Jonas Korlach, was um, I told you about some genes that are regulated, in this case, by singing behavior. This is in situ hybridization. It's the mRNA signal of this gene, DUS1. Uh, it's upregulated in the song learning nuclei when a bird sings, but not in the surrounding brain regions when the bird does other behaviors. Uh, and we found that in the songbirds, there is this repetitive structure here, uh, up, what we thought was upstream of the protein coding sequence. It turns out these are two different um, repetitive regions that are diverging from each other, that the assembly algorithms treated them as uh, repeats that strung them together when they really belong to two separate haplotypes. And when you separate out the haplotypes and string them together, now you get no gaps, and you get the correct repetitive structure in front of the gene. So um, <clears throat> uh, what that is to say is that uh, this, these haplotype false duplications, which we're, we're calling, was causing problems, which I just show you there, but also problems in understanding gene family evolution. So Constantina in my lab uh, looked at the oxytocin receptor and vasotocin receptor ligand family and found that in many of the previous assemblies, where you did not properly phase the haplotypes, you had false family gene duplications that led to incorrect conclusions about the uh, evolution of this gene family. So when we have more complete assemblies, we can now argue that it started out as a vasotocin receptor, split into two at the origin of vertebrates, uh, through a whole genome duplication, created two more copies. One of them we humans called oxytocin receptor, but it's really a sister gene to the vasotocin receptor. Uh, and then uh, in different vertebrate groups, you got extra segmental duplications, like Evan talked about, and then followed by deletions. And we can only get this by more complete sequences and get rid of false haplotype duplications that led to additional genes that, pe you know, in the literature, there are like 10 vasotocin and oxytocin receptors. They're not. There's six of them. The others are false haplotype duplications from the assembly problems. And the best way to get rid of these false haplotype duplications, um, uh, Evan, I mean, not Evan, uh, Adam Philippi's group, working with Sergey and Karen and others, figured out the best way to do it is use trios, where you sequence a, a child genome, you get the maternal, paternal uh, uh, contigs or reads, and you use the parental DNA and separate out the two read sets and then assemble after that. And when you do that, uh, before we did that uh, using TRIA, we had 5% false haplotype duplications uh, across the genome. 5% of the genome was falsely duplicated. Uh, when we uh, use this TRIA approach, we're down to less than uh, uh, 2%, so 1.4%, and it's even gotten better since then. Um, <clears throat> so this requires parental data. Uh, what happens if you don't have parental data? Well, Hung Lee's group, uh, working at Yun Chang, uh, developed tools to use HI-C approaches, and also we've worked with PacBio with Cronenberg's study, um, to use HI-C to actually separate out the haplotypes as opposed to TRIO. So here's that same zebra finch, uh, and these bubbles here mean uh, one scaffold or contig is from one parent, and the, when it's in the middle here, not along the sides, it means it has sequence from both parents. But with a TRIO approach, uh, using parental sequence to sort out your haplotypes, you get evenly split contigs or scaffolds uh, belonging to one or the other parent, but not both, like here. Uh, so in this case, using HI-C, you don't know whose parent it belongs to, but you get scaffolds representing individual chromosomes that are properly assorting to one or the other haplotype. Uh, and, that's, and what uh, HIU's approach here that was wor uh, worked well is not using HI-C after the fact to, to uh, phase haplotypes, but put the high c data into the assembly graph. And once you did that, it made clean separation of the reads being assembled into contigs into their proper haplotypes. And so you, everybody's talking about the telomere to telomere human genome, which is a great uh, um, uh, advance. Uh, but I want to, the one point that people forget about is that really what made this uh, successful, besides hundreds of people working on it, uh, was the fact that it's a haptidiform mole, uh, and basically it's a sperm cell that got duplicated uh, before it got fertilized, uh, and um, then kicked out the Y chromosome after that. Uh, and <coughs> uh, 
Therefore, you uh, get rid of the haplotype problem uh, to be able to assemble this more completely. So uh, when the, the biggest lessons learned here are is that haplotypes are one giant repeat, not just segmental duplications or centimeters, but the entire haplotype is a giant repeat in your assembly process. And you've got to figure out a way of phasing that. And the more phasing you do, the more accurate the phasing, the more accurate the assembly. Um, and uh, to get through these duplications, read lengths need to be longer than the repeats. Uh, and uh, the sequencing technology uh, needs to be able to get through complex structures like GC-rich regions. But we're also finding out that uh, packed bio reads, as well as nanopore reads, each one of them have difficulty getting through some type of sequence uh, that prevents us from having complete genomes, like uh, 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 GA regions, for example, for packed bio. And so... Um, <clears throat> Going forward, uh, a lot of projects now have been following th this model that we've been uh, working on going forward. Uh, some of them are phylogenetic-based, like the BAT1K project, uh, GIGA for invertebrates, uh, the Earth Biogenome Project, I'll tell you about in a second. Uh, some of them are geographic or national-based. Uh, these national projects are, are the ones that are um, getting uh, funding more easier, like sequence all genomes in the UK and Ireland. Uh, or sequence all genomes in all European countries for European Reference Genome Atlas, or all species of eukaryotes in Africa for the African Biogenomes Project. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the Human Pangenome Project also uh, basically consists of the same people that belong to VGP, Evans Group, and so forth. Uh, all of them are switching around like musical chairs in these various different projects and learning from each other. And, uh, <clears throat> and for, I just want to say a few words about this Pangenome Project. Uh, in terms of one goal in trying to include human population diversity that represents world diversity. Uh, but it wasn't easy uh, for this pangenome effort uh, to produce what we had with the haptidiform mole because we have one giant repeat. So we needed uh, more advanced approaches used on, than on CMH13. And just to show you... Uh, uh, the lessons we've learned here is using parental data. So the first... Nine, uh, 47 individuals used were trios uh, for the um, uh, pangenome project. We're going to get very nice, good separation using the parental data of each of these haplotypes uh, and chromosome lengths that are similar to what we see with CMH13, although not as complete. Uh, some of them having uh, less than two or three gaps. Some of them, like some of the uh, uh, larger chromosomes or the acrocentric chromosomes, having more gaps. And so... Um, <coughs> The biggest lesson learned here, again, uh, from Hayu's work, was using Hi-C to phase the haplotypes during the assembly graft process. Uh, and then Julio, from my group, uh, using um, uh, phasing information for the scaffolding, like with BioNano data or uh, Hi-C data, and then filling in gaps after that. And so uh, the remaining gaps in these close to telomer to telomer diploid assemblies is mostly in centromeres and telomeres or in some duplicated genes. The regular euchromatin sequence, as Evan was alluding to, is, is now assembled uh, without gaps in these uh, more uh, uh, diploid assemblies. And some of you have seen this published this week. And one of the lessons I want to tell you from this figure is that for every single genome we generated in this diploid assemblies for these individuals, we check quality baseball accuracy scores, uh, haplotype switch errors, uh, whether or not there are collapse repeats or there is expansions that don't belong. It's not, not just the N50 metrics. It's like 16 other metrics we're using to test for the quality of the assemblies to make sure we're uh, getting them as good as possible. And here's just some uh, uh, cartoon versions of now what these um, uh, pan genomes could look like from NHGRI and others who uh, reported on it. Uh, and it's remarkable the amount of different diversity. This is a cartoon. But uh, here, uh, from Jason Chin's efforts, looking at these uh, 90 four haplotypes across 47 individuals, the MHC region is uh, completely assembled across almost all of the haplotypes. And from one person to the next, even within the same person, uh, your different haplotypes for the MHC region could be drastically different of uh, what you inherited from mom and dad, basically. And so, uh, <clears throat> so future directions to end off here, and we need more people to get involved. How could you get involved? Uh, for the VGP project, uh, <clears throat> We're now almost towards the end of sequencing uh, roughly 260 species that represents 
what we think was all vertebrate orders, using the bird and the mammalian family tree here to define orders, a species that diverged uh, sometime in the last 50 to 60 million years from a common ancestor. When you do that, you, instead of 150 vertebrate orders, you get 260. Uh, and here's where you're at with uh, near-complete uh, genomes. When I say near-complete, so near T to T, but not T to T. Uh, 154 with 62 in progress, some that are still missing. And what we're going to do... Um, <coughs> is if you want to add genomes to this alignment, uh, we're going to take these 260 species, at least when we get to the 80% mark, uh, do a cactus alignment or a reference-free alignment to all of them, and any near-complete or high-quality assemblies that follow certain metrics that are out there, we'd like to include this in there, and NCPI and Ensemble are going to then propagate the annotations across all of them, and we'll also do other studies like uh, with phylogenetic trees. And we, here is a working space, what we call the genome mark, where we deposit all these assemblies. We now have 437 uh, species, 300 of them or so from uh, the VGP effort, some T to T uh, effort, and others that people have been generating outside the VGP consortium. So this is a site that we're now accepting all eukaryotic species for high quality reference genomes. Uh, and what are the criteria that we're looking for is to try to, for uh, half a gig or bigger genome is to have the contig M50 be 1 million base pairs or bigger, uh, the scaffold at 10 million base pairs or bigger, uh, overall base quality accuracy greater than 40, which means no more than one base pair error per 10,000 base pairs. Haplotypes phase, so what, tools that will phase them, uh, so you don't get those false haplotype duplications. And at least 90% of the assembly assigned to chromosomes, which happens during manual curation. Uh, and the typical numbers we're getting as of today uh, it, are these numbers here. We're, we're tenfold above our original metrics we set in 2017 uh, for most of these things. And, uh, and the methods, it's not just any assembly tool that gets us there. The methods that are getting us there are going to do a big shout out coming from Adam Philippi's group and Hung Lee's group uh, using um, either hi fiism or Virco on hi fi long reads as your base contigs, throwing, putting in ultra long into the graph like we do for the high C uh, before, and uh, uh, assembling them two together along with either parental trio data. That gives the highest quality assembly. And if you don't have parental treated data, then high C data. That gives the next highest quality for getting near T to T. Then you've got to scaffold the haplotypes separately. Uh, the YAS algorithm does that well with high C. Uh, and then you do have to do a manual curation to fix something, especially the sex chromosomes. But unfortunately, for this recipe, cell lines work the best for ONT ultralong. If you're using frozen tissue, it doesn't work as well. You don't really get as well as ultralong. So that's an issue that needs to be resolved. So if you don't have ONT ultralong, this recipe also works well. Uh, everything else there, uh, for either the trio or the non-trio data, again, scaffolding and then uh, manual curation. And we're developing and using, utilizing these pipelines for free on the Galaxy server that you can use. Uh, in different tools, Julio on uh, my lab, along with Mike Schatz here and others, working on putting all different modules here in a Galaxy platform, uh, whether you use BioNano or not, or HiC or not, you can combine them together uh, to generate some of these assemblies. And the Earth Bio Genome Project, I'll end off here, its mission is to do what I just told you on those types of assemblies, using those approaches for 1.8 million uh, eukaryotic species, uh, which is a lot. Uh, and we calculated the bill for that using those recipes that I just showed you at the end is about $3.6 billion uh, for all 1.8 million eukaryotic species. That's as much as people, a little bit more than what people were putting into the Human Genome Project. So for the Human Genome Project uh, money, we can do for the Earth Bio Genome Project with the same budget, um, even better genomes. All right. <laughs> And so uh, I'm going to end there and uh, thank uh, you know, the funders. The, uh, this is just funders for the particular part my lab has contributed to. Uh, but you know, as Evan said, this really takes a lot of effort. It takes a team. It takes the world village to do. And I'll stop there. And thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank, thank you. you. Questions? There's a hand up somewhere. Oh, I see. Oh, I thought there was one right there. Everybody's hungry for dinner. <laughs> there will be plenty. Michael? Uh, 
Uh, beautiful work. Um, how should I put this? So, uh, <laughs> I've been in DNA sequencing for 20-something years, and I'm a true believer in DNA. And at the same time, uh, chat GPT has changed my world in that okay. you can hallucinate language out of uh, neural networks. So I'm wondering, what's the connection between the genetics and the neural networks? And is there a way to kind of draw out more of the, I don't know, these intermediate phenotypes to understand the neural architecture that's in there? Yeah, there, there, there have been some people who have uh, been hypothesizing that learning and memory, actually, could that really involve uh, epigenetic uh, or even possibly genetic changes, nucleotide sequence changes, in your brain that then changes the neural networks. No one has yet found uh, de novo somatic changes in brain cells that correlate with changes or long-term memory uh, abilities, but epigenetic changes have been found, you know, methylation, uh, open chromatin regions, uh, to change in specific neurons with uh, uh, new changes in circuits and memory. And further, some of these epigenetic changes for whatever reason, can be imprinted in the germline that they get passed on to the next generation, if you or two generations. Uh, if you experience starvation or some kind of huge stress, uh, not only creates a long-term memory for you, but it also creates uh, some type of signal in the uh, gonadal cells that then lead to uh, the next generation, uh, let's say metabolism being ready for starvation or some other kind of stress. I'm not sure if that's the answer to your question, but... but like you, the I think so, yes, yeah. And, and what, I, what I like to see with these uh, large-scale projects is that now um, tools are available to not just sequence the actual genome, but the methylation patterns, and with FiberSeq uh, for the PAC biotechnology, the open chromatin patterns uh, from the genomes, from the samples that you sequence, where we can get epigenetic annotation at the same time we actually get a whole genome. Uh, nice talk. Um, and great work. It's impressive. So in your birds, do you have multilingual birds? And if you do, do they, like bilinguality in humans, like people that speak multiple languages? Yeah, so if you do, do they have any patterns that are distinct from the ones that don't speak multiple languages or don't have, imitate multiple Sounds. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so, so, uh, birds under, for vocal learning undergo critical period development, like we do for speech. And so, what what I mean by that is, uh, once they go through their um, transition into adulthood, it becomes harder for them to learn how to imitate new sounds or new songs. Uh, but it's also different from different species. So, a zebra finch. Uh, basically learns one song for its entire life, and then when it's adult, it hardly learns anything new. Whereas this parrot that I showed you can learn new songs or new vocalizations later in life, just not as good as, as a juvenile. And uh, some of these genes that I showed you that are specialized, up or down regulated in these song regions of birds are also changing during that critical period, like something called the NR2B glutamate receptor involved in neuroplasticity is changing at a different rate in these vocal learning brain regions separate from the surround, uh, non-vocal learning brain regions. And in species that can, uh, that, um, can imitate, I mean, that don't learn how to imitate in later in life, their NR2B is shut way down in the adult brain. Where species that can continue to learn throughout adult life, their NR2B goes down, but not as dramatically as the uh, ones who don't imitate. And what we don't have yet is what's going on with those epigenetic signals to regulate these genes differently in different species uh, to keep one's critical period a little bit more open than the other. But with these more complete genomes, I think we'll be able to find them. Hi, yes, thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, so we are talking about the variation in the human genome capturing the diversity across individuals. Do you have any guesses how much variation is there within species when we are, because we are assuming one species, one genome fixed, mm -hmm. but there's variation there too. Like how far are we to capture all that, right? Yeah, so, uh, so Amir Kenny in our group uh, for the Pan-Human Genome Project has been working with people to c come up with algorithms that then uh, calculate the amount of added variation 
after adding more new haplotypes into the assembly. Uh, and surprisingly, um, with, uh, we're, you know, we're now over 100 individuals, uh, with that number of people, uh, and there are two haplotypes, and trying to make, diversify the original samples we're using is from the 1000 Genomes Project. So we're already purposely trying to capture variation. Uh, but we're, we're actually starting to asymptote at uh, getting new variation. It doesn't mean we're not getting new. Uh, and Evans predicted uh, some of his calculations and some others that um, with about 350 people, so 700 haplotypes total, at least for, you'll capture most common SNP variation at 1% frequency in the population or higher. Uh, whether that's true or not, we'll have to find out, but at least we do have the tools to measure that. I don't think it's going to be in the millions. I don't think it's going to be in the hundreds, but maybe in the thousands we'll capture a lot of the common and a good amount of rare variation with thousands of individuals, complete genomes. Now, don't, don't quite, you know, I won't exactly bet you $100 on that, um, but it, that's humans. Now, there are other species like the zebra finch. We had 1.2% haplotype divergence in some of our individuals in an inbred colony at Rockefeller University. Uh, so we humans are a lot more homogenous than we think we are compared to these non-human animals. So for some of the non-human species, we're probably going to have to sequence more individuals to get the greater diversity that's in them. Have time for one more question, if somebody has a burning question. Oh. <laughs> All right, Caroline. So I know this isn't your focus, but I think it's an I think it's an interesting thing to think about when you think about sort of the Earth Biogenome Project is how rapidly our Earth is changing, right? Mm -hmm. And so how are you are you able to sort of look at when were we looking at these species and thinking about sort of the question of thinking about conservation and all of that in the context of these types of when you're doing these large-scale projects. Yeah, so there's a big conservation component for the Earth Bio Genome Project and the VGP Vertebrate Genomes Project itself. Uh, and one of the motivations that's driving the, these projects is because a lot of the species we want to sequence are near on the verge of extinction or their populations are declining rapidly and in our lifetime have a high potential of going extinct. And so we want to capture... Uh, uh, the genomic data, the complete genomic data as pos much as possible. In one is in case we can't save them, at least we'll have why we called it the genome arc, uh, a, a genomic database with some sequences from that uh, species. Um, but <clears throat> with, with uh, these more uh, complete genomes, we think we can get at um, you know, using uh, CRISPR editing to edit in alleles that um, that a small population, let's say, has become susceptible to some pathogen because of a lot of inbreeding. We can take an ancient allele, uh, genetically edit it in to the germ cells, and try to prevent that population from succumbing to uh, diseases according to small population size. To the other extreme, it's like we're sequencing genomes for Colossal. Uh, some of you may have heard about that company, uh, to, you know, like elephant genomes, to... Uh, Put into woolly, ma I mean, put woolly mammoth alleles into elephant for de-extinction purposes or de-extinction in the future. Same thing with the passenger pigeon uh, for revive and restore. So, uh, so it ranges the entire length, but with good quality genomes, you can manage populations better than not having it at all. Hmm? Great. Well, let's thank Eric again. <laughs> <laughs>